All right, people are already flooding in. Um, I'm gonna repeat all of this in a minute, but as you're coming in, you can just note that we have the chat open today. We also have the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen open. Um, so if you have any questions for the authors, you can drop those there. You can let us know where you're tuning in from um, and otherwise say hello and just make sure that your chat is set to all panelists and attendees if you would like anybody to know what you are saying to them. And uh, I'm going to drop a note about this, but we, there we go. We have live transcription turned on. So um, if anyone would like to make use of that, that is on there. So, all right. We have many, many people. I'm just gonna get started um, and welcome, welcome as people continue to tune in from, it looks like literally all over the planet, which is very exciting. Uh, to begin with, once again, live captions have been enabled for this event. If you would like to view the captions, you can find the live transcript button at the bottom of your Zoom window, or if your screen is not maximized, click the more button at the bottom of your screen to find it in the menu. These transcriptions are automatically generated. The chat and question boxes are open, so feel free to make use of those. Remember to set your chat to all panelists and attendees if you'd like to chat with others in the audience. Please drop your questions into the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom window only so that they aren't lost in the chat. As we can see already, this is going to be a very lively chat. And if you ask a question there, we will see it for one moment and never again. So thank you for using the Q&A box. Please note that Brookline Booksmith has a strict policy against abusive behavior and language and at our discretion, any attendee can be removed from an event for such behavior. So hello and welcome to this evening's Brookline Booksmith event with Becky Chambers and Martha Wells. Uh, my name is Alex Schaffner and I'm the events director at Brookline Booksmith in Brookline, Massachusetts. Um, whether you're an old friend of the store or a new one, I wanna thank you so, so much for being part of our community tonight and for supporting us and two wonderful authors with your attendance and your book purchases. Um, being able to put on this programming is amazing and the only reason that we can afford it is because of your amazing support. So thank you, thank you so much. You have bought a lot of books, so you're an amazing crowd. Tonight marks one of the greatest privileges that I've enjoyed in seven years as a bookseller. I am without overstatement entirely overjoyed to welcome two of the best writers in science fiction and fantasy working today. Becky Chambers and Martha Wells write the kinds of books that change both the readers who find them and really the entire genre in which they write. Becky Chambers rose in our heads and hearts as the author of the much decorated Wayfarer series. When I first read The Long Way to a Small Angry Planet, I knew I was reading something special, a book that embraced with joy and depth all the foundations of science fiction and applied to them a specifically contemporary insistence on wonder and compassion. Becky's world building is filled with a cultural and biological variety that is rare even in the wildest wilds of speculative fiction, her writing shows a devotion to not only a diversity of cultural contexts and physical alien bodies, but to divergence from norms, both invented and familiar. Most importantly, it shows divergence in individual personhood as a cause for love and connection and celebration. For a long time, I've thought of her books as directly descending from Ursula K. Le Guin's Hainish cycle. In her Wayfarer books, Becky studies an expansive seafaring, sorry, city, seafaring, spacefaring future critically, uh, with each new book tilting our understanding of that future world on its side and spilling out new and beautiful things. In A Psalm for the Wild Goat, Becky unwraps for us the first layers of a fresh story, one in which a monk who sees a contempl contemplative life is teased by the desire for something more than what should be perfect, one in which utopia-like we left behind the machines of our own destruction and what was left of them walked into the wilderness and began to build themselves into something wholesome, curious, and new. This is a philosophical book, funny and tender, and a warm breeze that invites us into what you might call a new space. Martha Wells has been writing for many years, a wonderful and expansive library of speculative fiction and fantasy for adults and teens. With all systems read, it's as though every science fiction and fantasy reader on earth who wasn't already in love with her work suddenly whipped their head around and realized 
And they were right to because Martha's last several years have been marked by a remarkable achievement of fiction. fiction. The Murderbot books are exquisite in their balance of reasonably hard sci-fi, suspense plots, and the precisely meted out character growth of one anxious, analytical, competent, and concerned partly biological weapon. All of these elements are what have made these books so wonderfully received, including Network Effect's very recent and much deserved Nebula Award for Best Novel and Locus Award for Best Science Fiction Novel. Six books into the series, we arrive at Fugitive Telemetry, a murder mystery on a space station where Murderbot is meant to be settling in, and Martha has yet to drop a plot to make any episode of Murderbot's story less engrossing or meticulously structured. As the series grows longer, her world builds brick by brick. In the foreground, we chase Murderbot through both high-stakes puzzles and its uncomfortably expanding understanding of its own personhood and the value of committing emotion to other beings, human, ship, or otherwise. Martha weighs the analytical and the sarcastic against the unwilling vulnerability of a narrator who would rather not feel things, and she makes us feel everything. What a feat. I zoom through these books because they are great stories and they stick to me forever because sitting in close proximity to a being who is simultaneously so awkward and so exceptional makes me feel great love for it and more human myself. So I am very, very pleased to be here and I am so glad all of you are here. So it's a pleasure to welcome Becky and Martha. How are you both this evening? Well, fantastic after that intro. Thank you yeah. so much. <laughs> Yeah, I do try. <laughs> <laughs> well, as you can see, I've been looking forward to this for several months, um, and I'm pretty sure everyone here has as well. So hopefully I'm speaking a little bit to um, what people in the audience are also feeling. It's really lovely to have you. Um, and I would love to hear from you both a little bit more about the two books that we're celebrating, Psalm for the Wild Built and Fugitive Telemetry. So how would you both describe your new books? As polar opposites. <laughs> <laughs> Do we flip a coin? Who's got, who's, how, what's the, what's the marching order here? Well, Becky is oh. on top of my screen, so. Okay. <laughs> All right, we'll, 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 we'll do that then. Uh, so A Psalm for the Wild Built uh, is um, a novella in a brand new setting for me. Uh, this is a, a solar punk science fantasy um, in which we're on a secondary world called Panga. It's where people live uh, and always have because I say so. Um, because I say so is my approach to pretty much everything in these books. Um, it, it While some of my previous stuff has leaned very heavily on real science, this is very much um, just, just its own world and stuff just works. Um, so the premise of this setting is that, um, hundreds of years ago before the book starts, um, robots gain sentience, factory robots gain sentience and decided to leave, uh, for the wilderness. And, uh, and they did so, um, and nobody has seen a robot since. And, um, in their stead, humanity rebuilt the world into a, a very lush, uh, ecologically sustainable society. Um, but even within that, uh, people still are people and people are messy and complicated and find reasons to be dissatisfied. And so um, as uh, Alex noted in their intro, um, the story focuses on a monk named Sibling Dex who uh, is dissatisfied with their life and uh, decides to um, just go off to the woods for a while, as one does. And in doing so, um, they encounter uh, the first robot that has made contact with humanity in, in 200 years. And they uh, they go on a cool road trip together. So that is the, the quick summary of A Psalm for the Wild Build. Very good, thank you. Let's see, Fugitive Telemetry is... Um... It's a six book in the Murderbot series. I had to think about that for a minute. Um, it's set between um, Exit Strategy and uh, Network Effect. It's actually a prequel to Network Effect. And it came about because there's a scene in Network Effect where Murderbot shows another character a video clip of an assassination attempt it had to, had to prevent. And in that clip you can see Murderbot kind of working really well with station security and later I thought you know that doesn't I, I need to set that up more I feel like that's a story waiting you know behind that and so I decided to write that story and also I just wanted to do it's it's a it's a sort of a locked space station murder mystery and I've always I've always loved murder mystery so I wanted to do one for Murderbot and there's also that transition period between 
uh, the end of exit strategy where things seem to be working out pretty well for Murderbot. Um, we all know that that doesn't, um, that nothing for Murderbot is going to be that easy. Um, and no place is perfect. So I kind of wanted to show all those adjustments um, because which is a theme of the series is that nothing is nothing is easy, particularly easy at any point. And um, um, even th fun things are hard. <laughs> um, so yeah, and it's a, um, again, yeah, it's, as Becky said, it's the, it's the polar opposite of, um, of Psalm for the Wild, Wild Built, where it is a very highly technological civilization um, that where everyone is just constantly connected and uh, it plays a lot with, I think, the people who fall into the margins uh, in between, even on preservation, they find places where, you know, things happen, you know, people can be hurt, um, and that's what, it's, that's what it's about. I think it's, um, it's great that you bring up the, the sort of differences of priorities um, that each of you have in, in building these books. Um, and I actually wanted to ask about that because you write very different books, um, but something that's exceptional in both of your writings um, is the detail work of your settings. I think in Murderbot, this is especially noticeable in terms of organizational and technological details. And Becky's books are, so I think, unusual in the breadth and the specificity of things like alien biology and culture. Um, and I think that sort of plays true um, in the new book as well. Um, so that's my observation as a reader. I would love to hear you talk a bit about um, what you consider to be sort of the foundational elements of your world building and maybe why you think that you're so attracted to that specific aspect or those specific aspects. Okay, well, I'll start, I'll start this time. Um, it, for me, it's different for every book. Murderbot is very different from my other fancy novels, particularly the books of the Raxura which in a lot of ways would probably be more like Becky's books in that there's, well, except for the fact that none of the characters are humans. So basically um, the technology is all biological in a lot of ways um, and they're fantasy. So magic is an element. So that's a very different approach to world building than it is in Murderbot, which is um, I need to be very specific about the technology because Murderbot's abilities are all technological and it's um, the way it can uh, get information from so many different sources. It sort of expands its point of view. Um, it can see multiple things going on at one time. It, it operates a little faster than the humans around it. So a lot of the difficulty in writing the books is trying to get that to feel realistic and uh, it makes them very hard to write because it's a lot of factors to take into account uh, at any one time. Um, so that's one of the reasons why I don't consider them hard science fiction because a lot of the technology is super space technology. Basically, it's like, I want them to be able to do this. I mean, we never explain how the wormhole works or anything. M mostly, it helps that Murderbot doesn't care about things that don't immediately <laughs> affect it. So it doesn't ever uh, get into this, um, get into a lot of the, um, this, I don't ever have to explain a lot of the super space technology and people understand it's just, you know, far future. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's one of the best things about far future is you don't have to get into that. Um, but the, you know, the way the, that Murderbot uses data, that's the thing that I have to be very specific about and I have to make work and be logical. Yeah, I I, uh, I use the same cheat a lot of the time of, you know, what what would these people actually know about how their technology works? And also just, you know, trusting that the reader knows, you know, that artificial gravity isn't really a thing, but it needs to be <laughs> for, yeah. for this story, you know. Um, so, I'm, I mean, with with my Wayfarer series, the focus there is very much on biology. Um, that's that's really sort of the, the the meat and potatoes of the world building is based on. I always start with um, 
what sort of physical traits do these people have? And then just expand from there. It's one of my favorite things to do is just say, okay, these people lay eggs or these people have chromatophores, they communicate through color. So how does that affect your civilization at large? You know, how does that affect your art and your architecture? How does it affect um, your notion of familial structures? How does it affect, um, you know, the sorts of technology you use, these sorts of things. All of it for me starts in what is your body like with that series. Uh, a Song for the Wild Bill is, is a different beast in that there are no aliens here and it's a very Earth-like world. It's just sort of Earth too. There's some, a few little differences, but really not. Um, and so the focus there is um, much more on technology, but in a very quiet way, because the focus of the book really is on these characters and their interaction. And neither of them are people, well, Moscat, the robot is not a person and will be the very quick to tell you that. But these two individuals, um, neither of them are people who are, who are technological experts. So technology really does take a back sort of a backseat for them you know it's something that's around and that they use and in the robots case it's something that you know they're made of but the, it doesn't really understand how it works um but in that in order to write about something casually I find that it's best to really put a lot of thought into how does this actually work even though that doesn't end up on the page like if I want to just gloss over something I do need to have a firm uh foundation for myself to know what it is that I'm skimming over. Um, so yeah, I spent, I spent a lot of time thinking through um, what sorts of green technology uh, this society relies on and how that differs between communities. Um, because just to say green tech, that can mean a lot of different things. And I wanted to make sure that it's clear in this world that there is no uh, one size fits all approach to it. There are different pockets of the world that do things differently depending on um, you know, their environment, but also on the, their cultural needs. Mm -hmm. uh, I think um, how people come about their world building is, is an interesting question as well, because on the one hand, I know um, people who write basically like a, a codex of everything they could possibly need. And then they just draw from the codex. And, and sometimes that's where they start before there's a story, there's the setting. And on the other hand, there are people who have a character or a story or a feeling that they want to chase. And as they're following that, um, the world populates itself around the story. Um, do either of you find that you do one of these things or the other more? We'll, I'll, we'll switch again. I, I do a, uh, I do a little bit of both. I do a lot of my world building up front, um, and I do write a lot more than actually ends up in the books. So and it doesn't matter which series we're talking about or which work we're talking about. That's always true. Um, with Wayfarers, I have a, a locally hosted wiki where everything lives, so, so that I can just pull things up as needed. Um, and also with Psalm, I did a, I did a ton of research and like notes and whatnot. I have a notebook, actually, I can see it right over there. It's like all full of post-it note tabs, you know, <laughs> so here's all the, here's all the little bits and pieces, um, even though it just might go into a sentence or two. There are things that naturally come up as I go along, you know, you'll hit that wall where you're like, how, how does this bike work? Or how, you know, like what kind of food do they actually have that you didn't think of ahead of time? So I like to stay flexible and be able to answer those things on the fly, um, A, because they're inevitable and B, just because it's fun. Yeah, I do uh, a lot of world building on the fly. I tend to try to, I, I get the characters I want to write about first, and then I have to develop the kind of world that would have built, that would have developed that person. Uh, that person would have grown up in. So uh, a lot of it's me going along kind of experiencing the story the way the reader would experience it and then figuring out, okay, I need to figure out this. I need to figure out that. You know, I've been referring to this and I need to kind of like, you know, buckle <laughs> down and figure out exactly what that's going to mean to the characters. Um, and yeah, and I, that's, that's a fun way for me to do it. I know some people really enjoy the other method where you develop the setting very closely first or in a lot of detail and then just kind of let the characters play in it but um I like to focus on the things I need and I'll come up with stuff that I <clears throat> excuse me that I won't end up using which will drive me up the wall and one book I had this one line about these two characters sitting down talking and then these mushroom people 
are clearly disturbed by their presence and keep trying to get away. <laughs> and I, and it just didn't fit in the scene. And so I carried that, that paragraph around the book, like looking for a place to put it. And I think I finally ended up saving it for another book, but stuff like that. We're just like the, it, it, you come up with, or just, I come up with so much fun detail as I'm, as I'm writing. Um, I don't feel like I would be able, like, I don't outline my books either. Uh, <clears throat> So I don't feel like I would be able to get that kind of detail whenever I've had to outline like for a, uh, a media tie-in. It's, it, I've realized that I can't do, I can't come up with the logistics of an action scene unless I'm actually writing it. Because it's just all the, when actually when you're in the point of view of the character moving through the scene, you think of so many other details that need to be accounted for um, that I would not be able to do in an outline. So. It's always, sorry, it's always so gratifying to hear other authors say, I hate <laughs> outlining, I can't do it. <laughs> like, if you twist my arm, I can, you know, I, I, if I have to, but I, I don't know how, I, I have no idea how you do that. I have no idea how you hold the whole yeah. book in your head uh, before you actually write it. No idea. Yeah. And just so many things, like, I had to do an outline for the Star Wars book and I come up with this big action scene for the climax and I start to write it and I'm like, none of this works. I've got main characters off stage, you know, while this is going on, it's just none of this absolutely works. And so, you know, it all has to get thrown out anyway. So it just feels like the outline is kind of a waste of time. Um, I always like to, I, I also like to hear that because I, I think, I think sometimes it can be hard to know what what you're working with until you're actually in the room and I think for some writers it's impossible to be in the room until you're writing out the details of it um so I truly find outline writers and people who create you know codexes to be quite unimaginable um and I'm glad that they exist but um it's a total mystery um speaking of the the little details um that do end up in the book um, I think I have relevant questions for each of you. Becky, how much tea did you drink, design, order, <laughs> and try out in order to write this book? So here's the thing. Um, I've always been a tea drinker, but I only got into loose leaf tea or like tea like really seriously after I wrote that book. Um, my, my wife got me, um, as a, yay, you finished the book present. She got me a very nice teapot and like a loose leaf tea subscription. And since then I've been super into it, but I was always very lazy about my, I was, I, I have one of those cupboards where there's like, um, you know, 10 boxes of, of bagged tea and there's only two of them I really drink and the rest of them just languish in the back. Um, so for a lot of it, I just made stuff up and here's the thing. I hate making up names for things. I will, I will freely admit that I hate making, it's like, it's, it's, it's ironic because there's no other genre I want to write in, but it does mean you have to make up a lot of words. So I did, I did just spend an afternoon with my notebook, just sort of throwing out various uh, plant sounding words and then smushing them together and being like, all right, there you go. These are now teas. <laughs> um, and have you, or has any any fan so far designed a tea for this book? Not to my knowledge. Um, there was I, uh, so my publisher tour.com, They did put out a tea with some some of the like um, you know when they were sending out review copies and whatnot. I know there was a tea that went along with it. It was a very nice green tea. Um, but since the book just came out today, uh, I don't know. I don't know if people want to make a tea. That would be very cool. <laughs> yes, uh, this is just a. A recommendation to everyone in the audience, please immediately go after this and design a tea. Um, <laughs> it's on you. Um, Martha, I think one of the things that people instantly relate to with Murderbot, as I'm sure you're very aware, um, is its sort of relationship with media and not just the fact that it likes watching stuff, um, but that it provides a really specific um, kind of therapeutic purpose for it as well as enjoyment um, and that it is very very interested in the things that it's interested in um, so this is sort of a two-tiered question um, which is one what are a couple of things that feel for you like Murderbot's things feel for Murderbot and two 
how did you come up with um, Murderbot's favorites, especially Sanctuary Moon? The, for me, shows for me that I feel about kind of the way Murderbot does. Um, one of my favorites for a long time has been Elementary. And um, because of the, the friendship between Sherlock and Joan and how it develops, um, that's really a comfort show for me. A lot of shows, it's like, I like a lot of shows. I've recently liked, I'm, I'm watching Loki. I love Legends of Tomorrow. Um, and uh, recently, I think The Untamed got me out of a, a writer's block that was, you know, the pandemic writer's block that a lot of people have. It just blew my, blew my mind open and got me writing again after six months of nothing. So, uh, but I think elementary is one I keep going back to as um, a comfort show. And it's like, I've always loved mysteries. And so that's a big part of it. But just that the rock solid relationship between those char two characters, no matter what happens and no matter, you know, when they get angry at each other or when they fight or whatever, but um, they still stay together and they still stay friends. And I think that's a big comfort thing for me. Um, how I come up with Murderbot shows is basically they're based on real shows loosely, basically. Uh, Sanctuary Moon, um, I was really big into um, uh, how to get away with murder when um, uh, I started writing All Systems Red. And the idea of that kind of, the show where these characters are just continually hit with everything. All these things are happening and everyone's, you know, running around trying to deal with all this stuff and getting into more trouble while they're trying to actually do their jobs as lawyers. And just the idea of that transposed to a space colony where people are trying to, you know, run this colony and they're being attacked by raiders and having all these normal science fiction space things, space, space opera things happen, but are also having these incredibly fraught relationships where everyone's just, you know, got it all out there and just <laughs> it just seemed like a really and it seemed like a, be a really good show it would sound terrible but they, in reality it would be this this would be so great Bingeable. Um, absolutely and it would also give murderbot context with the fact that it's set in a colony is something that murderbot knows about and a mining colony but also have all these different sorts of relationships between people um and then like there's that uh in network effect, they mention I think it's um, Time Defenders or Ryan or something like that. That's that's based on Legends of Tomorrow um, loosely, and then there's World Hoppers is Stargate and Stargate Atlantis kind of shows, and um, there's a few others that I've forgotten. But it helps me if to have a real idea of the show. So when I have to like pull out an episode or something that Murderbot or Murderbot and Art are watching, then I can kind of come up with that based on, um, it gives me an idea about what would happen, what would be happening in that show at that time. I always find the, the, the sort of like meta content within fiction to be one of my favorite little pieces, just because it doesn't have to have a huge ramification for the story as a whole, but it can be, it both shows you the writer having fun and can be a really clever little snippet that, reveals a lot more about the real world around it um, very succinctly while also telling you a lot about the character. So I, that kind of thing is so fun. And I think um, that and its feelings for its shows um, are some of the things that have been so um, effective about getting people obsessed with this character. Um, and on that note, I'd love to hear how both of you approach intelligences that aren't human um, and finding those voices and perspectives. Uh, I can start. Um, I think you have to really think about, like Becky mentioned, the physicality of an alien character earlier, and that's basically a, what that what that physicality would mean for you know their actions, their decisions, what they're able to do and not do, and kind of just try to stay as close into that point of view as you can. Um, And just, and also I've just kind of doing it over and over again. I've written a lot of alien characters by this point, I think. And um, you get better, or at least I've gotten better, I think, the more <laughs> I've gone along. And just kind of trying to think from that character's perspective. One of the things that started with Murderbot was um, 
what would an AI really want as opposed to what a human thinks an AI would want. Um, like the, I think Anne Leckie does this particularly well in um, Ancillary Justice of the idea of at first how that character when they lose their spaceship body and all the, the you know, ancillaries, the, the, you know, the, the horrible thing they did to the humans to make them ancillaries that that was using to see with and to experience things and then is put down into a small human body and how um, difficult that is for it. And also um, autonomous is a really good um, uh, example of a book where, where it contrasts a human's point of view versus uh, an AI uh, robot's point of view. Um, and just how different it is and how much misunderstanding there is uh, between those two characters. I, I would agree that writing aliens and writing robots is, is very similar. It's honestly, it's the same sort of thought process. It's just, you know, one squishier than the other. Um, so <laughs> yeah, it's, it's all about challenging your assumptions of what perception could be like and that's hard right because I mean, all we know is you know what what you know, this is the only sort of experience I've ever had but but that's what makes it fun is to is to challenge um I mean stereotypes is kind of a weird word to talk to use because we are talking about like fictional beings here but for, for robots for example you we tend to think of them as unfeeling and cold and like hyper logical um but they don't have to be you know I feel like that's a very um that, that's a very narrow-minded idea of what a robot could be you know especially if you are talking about something that is that is sentient um and capable of reflecting on the world you know we don't understand how intelligence arose within ourselves. So why would we under, you know, why would we think that intelligence within a machine would, would be, you know, this very, very limited thing. Um, so with, with all, all of the uh, artificial life forms I've ever written, uh, emotion is a big one for me that I, that I want to include. They don't necessarily emote exactly as people do, but I don't think that that makes their emotions any less important or real. Um, in the same way that it wouldn't with an alien character. Um, I don't think that emotion is the antithesis of logic. You know, it's, they're always pre presented as these opposing forces, which doesn't make sense because we harbor both, right? And, and they, they do balance each other out. And so um, I think um, that, that that's a quality I like to have in my robots. Um, I also like to, I also like to put little things in there just to tweak the reader's assumption of, of what a robot might do. Uh, Mosscap, the robot in um, A Song for the Wild Bull is bad at arithmetic. Um, it has a really hard time um, doing anything with numbers on the fly. It has to sit and use its fingers because it wasn't programmed for that. Um, and so uh, just, just a little stuff like that, I think is, is really fun to play with. Um, I, and I hope it's fun for the reader as well, but it's mostly fun for me to just say, well, a robot doesn't have to do math, why not? <laughs> um, well, speaking about emotion, I very strongly feel that part of what has propelled, a really big part of what has propelled both, um, both of your work sort of forward as these huge successes in the last few years um, is that, again, you do do intricate and interesting and unusual world building. And I think when you get into the meat of the book, that is very evident um, and very, you know, um, compelling. But also um, compassion both within and for your characters is really central um, to the way both of you write. Um, and I wonder if you think that that is something that readers are particularly hungry for at the moment or um, are just getting to access a bit more. I think there's definitely a hunger for it. Uh, I've, I've noticed that um, in the, the years that I've been writing Wayfarers and in the other works that I've done alongside. Um, people, people want hope for the future. Um, I mean, that's what I went into um, you know, my career wanting to do was, was tell stories that made people excited about the, the, the future and the possibilities that may hold. And that isn't to disparage stories that are dark or that are grim or that have, you know, uh, more negative portrayals of the future because we need those too, 
you know, in both as cautionary tales, but also just because they're good stories, but, and, but also as a place to vent and just like get your feelings out about how oogie everything feels so much of the time. But I think that as a counterbalance to that, um, it's important to have stories um, that say, okay, well, we might be struggling right now. We might be going into a bad future or we might already be in one, um, but what's on the other side of that? What makes the struggle worth it? Because it can't just be survival, right? It can't just be, we're just going to eke it out. You have to be working for something. And so in that, um, yeah, compassion and, and hope are, are things that um, I put, a, I, I, I really hold on to while I'm writing my stuff. And, and from, from the conversations I've had with readers, I, I would say that um, there, there's a definite, um, a definite hunger for that out there right now. And so I'm, I, I do think that we're seeing more of it. These are especially in the here and now people are, are tending to write things that, that serve that need a little bit more. Um, so yeah, it's, um, it's something that that's central to all my work. And that doesn't mean necessarily that it's, um, these are sugar-coated stories, right? Like bad stuff happens. I think that that's an important part of writing a hopeful story in that you have to show how bad it can get. You have to show that bad things still happen. You have to show that life is still unfair. Um, but I try to tell stories in which the focus is on the healing that comes after. Yeah, I think for me, um, Books that were an escape or a comfort were really important to me um, when I was a teenager and when I was in college and actually through, <laughs> through most of my life, I guess. And um, one of the things I think I've gravitated toward is authors that I feel safe with, that they're, um, the way they do their characters, um, I don't know, with, with compassion and with caring, even under really um, uh, terrible circumstances, that uh, there's something just innately comforting about that. Um, and so that's kind of what the kind of book I've tried to write. Mm -hmm. um, and I think um, one of the best compliments I've gotten is when someone said, I was really afraid with this situation in the book, but I trusted you to get them <laughs> that they would come out of it on the other end, you know, in, um, uh, in a way that didn't break me <laughs> kind of. <laughs> so, um, yeah, that's, um, and I do think that there is a, uh, the, the worse things get for us, that the more the need is for that kind of book. And again, like, like Becky said, the, the dark stories, we need the dark stories too because there are a lot of people who kind of need to see that and need to process that in a safe environment. Um, but uh, there's a big need for the comforting books too. It looks like we lost Becky for a moment. So um, pardon me while I try to find out where we lost her. Um, but while I'm doing that, um, Martha, I wondered, you, you were talking about books that you were reading um, you know, over the course of decades. And I wonder if you see um, the desire for a sort of a hopeful science fiction as something that's increased with time, or if maybe you see um, the range of people who are allowed to experience it within sci-fi as changing more. I think it's, I think it's the second one. I think that one of the really cool things about um, the incredible resurgence of science fiction and fantasy in the, with these new voices and these diverse voices and telling fantastic stories is that it has widened um, just the availability of science fiction um, for a lot more people. Um, I have a friend who's, um, he's a straight white guy and he's been reading science fiction since he was a kid. And he had, uh, he was, for a long time, he just, he kind of stopped reading novels and was just reading short stories. Um, and short story collections because he, he said, the, you know, he just realized he, it was just one too many space jock going off to do whatever. And he started reading novels again because the, 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 the things that are coming out now are just uh, so many different types of story um, and just doing things that 
uh, I don't think people, you know, in, in would have thought would possible, you know, um, that science fiction, I think, had gotten not necessarily cookie cutter because there was always good things being written, but the categories were kind of squeezing down very narrowly. And now it feels like I remember being on a panel arguing about the difference between epic fantasy and high fantasy and noble fantasy or whatever. And it's like, I don't know. <laughs> They're all just fantasy, aren't they? And uh, now I think we see the categories expanding and, and uh, uh, to kind of expanding to take in a lot of different, you know, really cool ideas that we didn't have before. Um. Yes, still no Becky, still working on it, not to worry. Um, a lot of people are talking in the, in the chat um, about um, Murderbot's kind of combination of features. Um, and I think something that I and people I know have found really useful and, and, and interesting and compelling in Murderbot's characterization um, is that you're very comfortable making somebody who's uh, social interactions and yes, oh, I'm so sorry about that. <laughs> no worries. Um, we're going to loop you back in in just a moment. Um, this is great. Um, <laughs> yes, Murderbot is um, analytical and uncomfortable and still emotional and compassionate. And I think a lot of people, especially neurodivergent people, see themselves represented in that in a way that not a lot of books handle. Um, not least books that are supposedly about neurodivergent people. So I was wondering if any of that is deliberate or if it's just sort of like a nice side effect. Uh, well, I'm, I'm neurodivergent. So a lot of times people ask me about something in one of my books and I'm like, especially early on, and I'd be like, isn't that normal? <laughs> um, <laughs> so uh, I didn't, when I wrote All Systems Red, I didn't realize how much of myself I was putting in there. Um, but, um, yeah, it's, it's it just all comes <laughs> things from, you learn when you write. <laughs> yeah. It just, um, it, it, it just, it all comes from uh, a realistic place. Let's put it that way. <laughs> well, and there you go. That's one of the things that's so interesting about, about writing like these non-human characters is that ultimately, um, their intelligences have to come from our human intelligences. Um, and it just, lets us, I, I think, emphasize and show appreciation um, for aspects of ourselves that might be seen as uncomfortable, um, you know, when you're going around living your life as a normal person. Um, and it's sort of nice to give it that, that, that breath of fresh air and um, sort of say, this is good, actually. It's just good. Um, Becky, when you were away, I'm so yeah, glad when I was falling <laughs> off the internet, I guess. I'm so, glad, I'm so glad you've returned. Yes. Um, we were just talking a bit about um, how sci-fi has changed, and Martha was saying whether she thinks that um, sci-fi has changed in the amount of the, the degree to which it's dedicated to sort of like hope and future vision in a hopeful sense versus that hope just being ever present in the genre, but being opened to, to more types of people. Um, and I want to make sure you heard that question because I think it's like very relevant um, to a lot of what you write. Definitely, yeah. I think that um, I think that what we're seeing is that it's it's there are a lot lot more types of people who are telling science fiction and fantasy stories nowadays. Not that we haven't been all along, but I feel like uh, voices that that were on the margins for a lot of the genre's history have really risen to prominence. And, and that only makes the table bigger and bigger and bigger with every year. You know, the more people we let in and the more people we encourage to tell their own stories, that has a ripple effect, right? That means that we're, we're getting all this amazing new stuff that's out there. I mean, we really are living in just such an incredible time. Um, not, you know, a little bit biased because, you know, this is, <laughs> this is where we work, but <laughs> no, I mean, it's, it's spectacular to see the, um, just the, the, the wide array of, of voices and perspectives that, that are present in, in sci-fi and fantasy now. And I think that because of that, um, you know, you're not just talking about, you know, the sorts of 
character representation that you see on the page or on the screen, you're also talking about the, the approaches to things like hope or the approaches to things like, um, you know, uh, what, what sort of futures we're aiming towards. These are all things that are very base, like deeply, deeply rooted in, in cultural and subcultural experience. Um, so I think that, um, yeah, so, so long as we continue to keep these doors open, I see it as nothing but, but a net positive for, for all of us, um, you know, who, who write and enjoy this stuff. It's a Absolutely. new golden age of science fiction and fantasy. For sure. It really is. Um, but I think one thing that I, I think anyone who's reading either of your books can see is what a, a strong foundation in the literature of the genre both of you have. Um, so I would be interested to hear if there are any books that you found particularly formative. And I'd really love to know if, if somebody comes to mind, um, if there's an author whose work you love, but um, which you sort of challenged in your own writing. I think a, a good example of, of recent books um, is Nevo's uh, Chosen in the Beautiful, which is you know, a direct retelling of The Great Gatsby, but I think a book that could not have been written if she did not care about the source material as well as wanting um, to change it and, and redirect it and reframe it. Um, so, so sort of a similar thing without necessarily doing retellings, if there's anyone who comes to mind. And I would say that with um, with my Wayfarer series, um, a lot of it was based in um, here are things I, I the bones I have to pick with Star Trek, and I say that with so much love because I I love Star Trek forever and ever and ever always. Um, but there was a you know growing up with it, there were a lot of things where I was like that seems like something we could poke at, or you know this is maybe <laughs> not the you know the the shiny idealistic principle that you think it is or you know just like all of I can't I can't point to one thing in particular about it but you know just just that but also all of the space opera I, I absorbed as you know in my youth um you know it's it things where it and it does come from a place of love of really deep love of because I love this so much here's how we're going to try and nudge it and not necessarily make it better because that's subjective but um you know, we'll, let's let's try and put a different spin on it and see what that does. Uh, for me, I think when I was growing up, um, a lot of the first science fiction I was reading was uh, in the early '70s, because I'm really old. Uh, um, and so many of the books, especially the children's books around that kind of time, it was very difficult to find one like an adventure book where the girls weren't just the load or the babysitter. And that's one reason why I kind of got into reading science fiction and fantasy that was probably way too old for me at the time. It's just even the fact that there was pictures of female characters on the cover doing stuff that were clearly, you know, part of the adventure. Like Andre Norton, um, mm -hmm. uh, her books would, I think would be more considered middle or young adult um, now, but, um, she has a lot of female characters and even her. Uh, when you read that kind of book where it's so, um, where the women are so um, sidelined um, and basically in so many of them were treated as second-class citizens or children, you know, tall children, <laughs> basically um, what it does to your sense of self, um, it's, it's a lot like brainwashing and you can watch um, women authors who grew up during that time period and who, or who wrote during that time period and how long it takes you <clears throat> to realize how you've been basically, um, can't think of words today, in, um, indoctrinated um, to do that. Um, I remember taking like, um, I guess it was, um, my Star Wars novel. So it wasn't, you know, that was in 2014. So it wasn't that long ago. Um, and just deciding whenever I was going to mention a side character, I was going to make them make more women than men. And how much effort, you know, reminding myself, yeah, I'm doing this, you know, and it's just like it really start to, it just takes you a long time to realize how 
how that's affected you. Um, and so, yeah, I think uh, I'll, um, a lot of the stuff I've been doing like within the past 10 years or so has 10, 15 years um, has been a resistance to that. You know, I've done, I've done female main characters beforehand, but um, it does take you a long time to kind of write yourself out of that, that indoctrination. Uh, even if you think it takes you a long time to kind of realize how, how deep into your blood and bones it's gotten. Um, so yeah, and I've forgotten the question. Oh, what we're writing, kind of what we're writing in response to. Um, yeah, it's definitely that. I think that's, that's very much uh, been throughout my writing. It's been a progression uh, and I can see how it's, how it's changed over time. Um, well, I just opened the Q&A box. So that's why I've gone suddenly silent because we are <laughs> um, inundated with some incredible questions. I appreciate both of you answering all of my questions um, so wonderfully so far this evening. Um, it's already 7.50. I would like to get as many of these audience questions in as we possibly can. Um, so thank all of you for submitting these. This is just, I said at the beginning of the event that this was going to be an incredible chat and Q&A and you're here, you've done it. Um, we have a couple of questions and have had some mentions in the chat of hope punk as a genre. Um, is this a, a term or a category that you're both familiar with? Um, do you feel like you're a part of it? Um, and, and do you have any other recommendations for book, books that you would consider to be in that category? Um, I know it's, it's, a, it's a category that gets applied to my work a lot and I, I love it. Um, it's not one that I would personally use, not that I don't think, not that I'm like, no, don't use that, but just because it's, it's new to me. And so mm -hmm. I'm like, oh, okay, cool. Um, I would say, um, I would say Charlie Jane Anders is, is um, someone else who, who would fit very well into that category. She writes um, just sparklingly good stories. And, and they're, I mean, they, they too are, you know, full of tough stuff. Um, and, and she definitely doesn't flinch from that. But um, if, you want, if you want stories that are weird and wonderful and just, just so strangely beautiful, I'd, I'd really recommend her stuff. Yeah, I don't know how, how much it's applied to my work. The For Hope Punk, I think this, it came out before this, that that term was common, but uh, The Best of All Possible Worlds by Karen Lord, I would definitely say that's a Hope Punk uh, novel because it's basically about, in some ways, a recovery from a terrible disaster and people trying to help or make that better and then just... Um, some lovely character interactions. It's one of, it's just, uh, I just absolutely love that book. Hey, Benjamin says, I'm new to your writing, Becky. I just wanted to know the reason for your writing your latest book, life event, or just an idea that popped into your head. Just an idea. It was just a thought. I cannot tell you exactly where it came from. Uh, I like to, I like in um, writing books to making dinner out of all the leftovers you have in the fridge. It's just, it's a collection of all sorts of different uh, creative influences and stuff I think about. And it's, it's a big old hodgepodge. All right. um, sometimes that's the way to go. You just mm -hmm. have to follow that first clue and see what else grows around it. <laughs> Um, Ginger says, you both write minor characters with such brilliance. Becky, I'm dying for a book that returns to Chef and the characters from Angry Planet. I saw you were done with that world and just cried. Ginger, you're not alone. Martha, will we get more of Art and Murderbot with Mensa and her family on Preservation Ops? Um, definitely more of Art and Murderbot, I think. I have um, a contract for three more Murderbots, probably two novellas and one novel. Um, I just, I meant to write one last year, but again, I had the writers, the pandemic writers block for six months. <laughs> and then I had to, uh, I ended up starting a fantasy novel to, uh, which is going to be the next book I have out, uh, knock on wood, it's, it's almost finished. Um, and, um, so there will be the next thing I'm going to write when I'm done with this is going to be, uh, try to start some murder bot. I tried to start like 
a dozen different murder bot stories at the beginning of the pandemic when I was trying to write and they just all crashed and burned because I just didn't have the concentration to do it. Uh, murder bots, again, it's like I said, it mentioned it's very logistically difficult to write and my brain was not working. So uh, <laughs> I'm going to start it up again, <laughs> to kind of do a fresh start and um, try to get going and get on it again. Um, and Becky, you're, you have, you have stopped the Wayfarers books, but um, my understanding is Song for the Wild Built is the first monk and robot book. Is that right? That is correct. So yes, I'm, I'm done with Wayfarers. Um, uh, Song for the Wild Built is the first monk and robot built book. I've written a second one. Um, I, at the moment, I'm starting on something completely different. Um, I've just headed into a brand new project in a brand new setting. That is all I can say about it at this moment, uh, because that's how these things work. Um, but yeah, it's uh, it, I, I'm taking the opportunity to uh, <laughs> to go visit different worlds, and it's a lot of fun. Um, well, basically, the chat right now is saying that they will go anywhere and read anything that you care to write. <laughs> so. Um, and we at Brookline Booksmith fervently agree. Um, John says, for both authors, which alien or fantastic creature you've created are you the most delighted with and why? Yeah, we both made the same, the same face of, <laughs> um, that's, such a, that's such a hard call. Usually it's the one I'm working on then because you're so involved with that character when you're writing them. But I think art's going to be one of my favorites. Um, moon art is amazing. Death. I just want to interject. Art is like one of my favorite fictional characters in the last like five years. So, <laughs> Well, originally it wasn't even in the story. I do a lot of, when I write Murderbot, I end up writing like 10, 20,000 words and then getting it all out and starting again usually. And art wasn't even in the first version of Artificial Condition. Wow. <laughs> Well, we're very happy with how things turned out. <laughs> I'm the opposite in that um, I never like what I'm working on in the moment. It's always like the thing I already finished that I feel very fondly about. But the thing that's right in front of me, I always want to set on fire because um, it never, it, it, it always feels like a huge mess. And then once it's done, I'm, I'm good with it. And I have to pick a favorite that's really hard. Um, I would say, I would say probably Sidra from a close and common orbit um it's a tough call i mean you're asking me to choose among all my babies but <laughs> but um but i do have a really a really soft spot for that character and i, I enjoyed writing her very much um becky tamara or tamara i'm sorry it's probably one of those becky would you ever do a silmarillion style all lore book for any of your series you know, I get asked that question a lot about Wayfarers. I've considered it. I do not have any immediate plans to do so. Um, it would take a lot of work in that my notes are not human readable, but I will, I will keep the door open for that possibility. That's very kind of you. We would all <laughs> definitely, definitely read it. Um, Martha and Becky, says Julianne, thank you so much for joining this evening and thank you for your wonderful writing. Martha, I am really curious how you process readers' gendering of Murderbot. Murderbot is very clear that it does not want to be ascribed to gender and moreover finds gender somewhere between uninteresting and gross. <laughs> Murderbot is truly the most relatable being alive. <laughs> um, but readers who love Murderbot nonetheless insistently ascribe gender to it, usually their own. What do you make of this? Um, I didn't expect that to happen. I thought people would just, you know, take it at its word, but that's not, I, I realized later that was incredibly <laughs> naive. Um, one of my friends early on after All Systems Red came out actually went over Goodreads and did percentages of who said he, who, who said she, who used they, and who avoided pronouns altogether, and who actually used Murderbot's pronoun. Uh, and that was an interesting, interesting mix. Um, I, I, I kind of don't mind in some cases because, um, you know, people, people are people and they're doing their thing, but um, 
And a lot of people are going have a visualization of Murderbot when they first start reading it, and they kind of go by that. Um, I think what bothers me is the people who keep asking me, uh, either on Twitter or or in other places, what Murderbot's gender is, and you're just like, it's in the book. <laughs> it already told you. <laughs> just because you don't like the answer doesn't mean it didn't tell you. Yeah, and it's like I'm I'm <laughs> sort of like if you're asking me what kind of genitals Murderbot has, it doesn't have any, and it says that too. So I don't know what you want me to say. So yeah, it's 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 just that's been eye opening for me. Um, and I usually I usually just react by not answering that question because it's sort of like if you didn't believe it when it told you in the book, like flat out, um, you're not gonna believe me. I guess um, when I tell you on Twitter. <laughs> I, I like the hierarchy that you've set it. up there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that's that's been a weird situation. Uh, we have several questions. Um, obviously, people know that good writers are good readers. Um, we've had several questions of people who are asking um, about books that you have been recently very much in love with. Is there anything over the last year and a half of Regardless of, you know, if you've, if you've been able to read, is there something that when you think of it just sort of like lights you up? Um, the Chosen and the Beautiful. That was, that was a lovely book. Um, I liked her other books too. Yeah. Um, I, I read Chosen and the Beautiful and then I read the other two all within like three days. So <laughs> yeah. Um, the, uh, the Lady Astronaut books um really love those especially the the last one um it was excellent yeah moon mm -hmm. when they're trapped on the moon that was really good um um oh soul star by cl polk that was my favorite of that trilogy um that just it kind of builds i guess you would you would need to read the first two to really kind of get what's going on but that story really builds um and that's a wonderful finish to it. Um, I'm looking at my shelves. <laughs> I will admit, I had a I had a difficult time reading during 2020. I tended to gravitate toward comfort food a lot, things I'd already read before and things that were old favorites. Um, one that is a book I turn to uh, consistently during tough times or just anytime I need I need sort of a book hug is uh, Changing Planes by Ursula K. Le Guin. It's a really, really wonderful short story collection of hers. Um, and it was um, something that was very formative to me when I was first sort of starting to wrap my brain around, I think I want to write sci-fi one day. Um, so if if you enjoy her work, or even if you're not familiar with her work, I think it's, it's an excellent place to start. And it was... Um, Definitely, definitely a warm, cozy blanket of a book for me last year. Um, I think a great place um, to close out is with a question from Anna, who says, a multi-segmented question. How do you feel about the fact that your books are known as comfort books? Do you think we'll see more and more of this comfort genre? Um, what do you think about how people connect to these works as almost therapy? And how do you think the genre is going to develop over the next decade? With, I'll add a note, the last year plus was a rough one and your books brought me so much hope. And I know I will return to these again and again. Thank you for writing them as they were. That's so kind, thank you. Um, I, I, I am delighted whenever I hear people say that uh, my books are comforting. I take it as an enormous compliment. Um, and uh, it is something I, I, I try to do with my stuff. Um, so, so it's always, um, it's very nice to hear. So thank you. Um, I would, I think we're going to see more in that vein as we move forward, especially coming out of the pandemic. Well, I mean, we're not out of the pandemic yet, but coming out of 2020, at least, um, I, th I think that people are, um, really, really keen to have books that, um, feel safe, um, not that, that people don't want to be challenged, not that people don't want new ideas, but I think people are, are really looking for stories that, um, you know, that, that aren't 
taxing, I think is, is the word for it. Um, so I would say as terms of what that means for the genre, I mean, I have no idea what's going to happen in the next 10 years, but I, I do think that in the immediate here and now, um, I, I think we're going to see a, a rise in that and, and how that will affect things through the next decade. Uh, we'll see. I'm about this. My feelings are about the same. Uh, I love it when people think my books are comforting. Um, and um, I think 2020 is going to spark a lot of, um, you know, comfort and escape books. Um, I, you know, and again, people will need to process it. So again, we'll probably have some dark stuff that will be popular, but uh, everybody processes in different ways. Um, and yeah, I hope the genre continues to expand the way it is. I mean, um, I've heard this referred to as the new golden age of science fiction or the real golden age of science fiction. And I hope it, I hope it continues. And we just kind of, um, that we start seeing the people who became uh, science fiction and fancy fans from the books were coming, that were coming out this period and got inspired to write, we're gonna see them their work start to show up, you know, um, you know, in the next, in the, in the coming years. And it's interesting to see what, what they're going to do. The, the, the generation of writers who are being inspired or inspired by all these different books that are coming out now. Um, I think that is lovely. And I think it's true. Just looking at, at what we've been seeing and how the, the field has sort of been unfolding, um, over the last few years, um, I think your your books are part of a really refreshing and heartwarming and um, a necessary expansion of of people being allowed to voice themselves. And when that happens, um, I think things do get more hopeful because the less um, the less tight fisted the genre is, um, the more possibility gets open. Um, so I want to thank both of you very, very, very much um, for joining us for this evening. Um, it's wonderful to get to chat with you. It's wonderful to be, if not in a room with everyone here, um, then at least seeing all of your amazing chats go by. Um, once again, if you haven't bought the books from us yet, but you would like to, uh, until tomorrow morning at nine, you can still go to that same Eventbrite registration page. And um, we still have a few of Becky's books that are signed. And we still have a few book plates from Martha. So your opportunity remains. Um, in the meantime, I hope everyone has a good morning, evening or middle of the night, no matter where you are. And thank you both again so, so much. Yeah, thank you so much. This has been awesome. Yeah, thank you. This was great. All right, good night, everyone. Take care. <laughs>